When most animals are born, they look like mini adults. Puppies look like smaller versions of, of larger uh, male or female adult dogs. Kittens, horses, turtles, and sharks, they all pretty much look like a mini version of what they're going to mature into. However, maybe you didn't know this, a baby kangaroo, when it's born, informally is referred to as a roo. And it's about the size of a jelly bean and kind of looks like a hairless worm. It's completely blind and weak, although it instinctively finds enough strength to use its four tiny legs to journey up the mother's body and climb into the mother's pouch. There it can feed on nutrients until it is transformed into a joey, which then looks like a mini adult kangaroo. Tadpoles transform into frog. Caterpillars transform into butterflies. And we see the reality of transformation in the animal kingdom. However, there is a much greater reality of transformation in the kingdom of God. In order to enter into the kingdom of God, God himself must transform one's life from sinner to saint, from slave of sin to slave of Christ, from a child of Satan to a child of God by way of the new birth. The preaching of the new birth was the dominant focus of the preaching ministry of George Whitfield. And he said, it is the very hinge on which the salvation of each of us turns. Follows that read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not yet understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of things we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Previously in this series, we preached that the new birth is a necessary birth that all men need. Secondly, it's a supernatural birth that must come from heaven above to one's soul below. Thirdly, it's a scriptural birth rooted in the Bible, the only word of God. And it's an immediate birth. It's not a process. It happens in a pinpoint in time. Today's sermon uses yet another lens to look at the new birth and is titled, A Totally Transforming Birth. And I have four points to consider from John chapter 3, verse 1 through 13. Point number one, Regeneration in relationship in verses 1 through 3. Point number 2, regeneration is transformation in verses 5 through 7. Point number 3, regeneration in characters in verse 8. Point number 4, a regenerated rabbi in verses 9 through 13. The new birth will emphatically, radically, and dramatically change your life from the inside out. Someone cannot be born again and remain the same. Pastor Peter preached last Sunday, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. After my hip surgery was complete, all the arthritis that racked my ball and socket joints for years was suddenly removed from inside of the body, and it was not a work I could have done on my own. The surgeon had to dislocate my hips, shave away the arthritic problem, and put me back together as new. Someone's life cannot be invaded by Christ or the Holy Spirit and remain unchanged. 
George Whitfield said, they must be in Christ by an inward change and purity of heart and cohabitation of his Holy Spirit. The new birth happens to us, but not by us. Psalm chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2 displays that once you walk as the Gentiles walk, in the futility of your darkened minds, in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, and sitting with those that mocked God. But no longer. When you were regenerated, you were given spiritual life where you once lived in spiritual death. You put off the old self, which was corrupt through the deceitful desires and made a break with this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And your life underwent new management. Amen? Point number one, regeneration in relationship. Verses 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, it's been said, if your religion can't save you from your sin, you better change your religion. The religions of the world, they all attempt to change People from the outside in. The seven sacraments of Roman Catholicism, five pillars of Islam, the eightfold path of Buddhism, all attempt to make devoted followers by having the adherents practice certain disciplines to merit salvation or nirvana. But it's all a counterfeit to the new birth because regeneration in a person's heart is a change from within that manifests outwardly in their devotion. It doesn't matter how cool and shiny the car is outwardly, if the engine is dead internally. The life of Nicodemus shows us it does not matter how devoted, sincere, disciplined, knowledgeable, and active one is religiously if the heart of stone is cold, dead, and lifeless. He was highly religious outwardly, but inwardly his heart engine was dead and he couldn't bring it to life. He had to be made alive by Christ. In Luke chapter 9, verse 59 to 60, in response to a disciple who wanted to sp spend time at home before committing himself to the Lord Jesus, Jesus used a play on words to make a spiritual point by saying to him, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Are you more concerned with the pursuing the kingdom of man, the kingdom of this world, or proclaiming the kingdom of God? Are we more concerned about our homes and our cars and everything else than living right for Christ? I fear that many of us get caught up in the hustle and bustle of this life. It's all going to go. You're not going to take one thing with you. The new shiny car, it's not going to heaven. Right? Right? The new house, the new this, the new that. You're not taking anything with you. Heirlooms, they're not going to heaven. Through general revelation, all men know that God exists according to Scripture. Romans 1.20 tells us His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Psalm 119, the heavens declare... They are a written record of the glory of God in the sky above proclaims or announces his handiwork. Creation proclaims there's a creator, but man needs special revelation through the scriptures. They need the new birth to be converted by Christ through the agent of the Holy Spirit. And he uses the instrument of God's word. Nicodemus, he's a lost Bible teacher. He believed in God. He even taught the scriptures, but he remained unconverted. He came to Jesus by night, and although cordially calling Jesus a teacher come from God, he failed to realize that Jesus was God come to teach. But Jesus put his divine finger on the heart of the issue and answered a question Nicodemus didn't even ask with his lips, but it was bursting from his heart. For he himself knew what was in man, John 2.25. He told Nicodemus that one must be born again or one can never see or enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't need to turn over a new leaf. The whole tree of his life was twice dead. He was like chaff, the worthless part of the grain in Psalm 1. He had no root. John Calvin said, The whole life of man, until he is converted to Christ, is a ruinous web of wanderings. 
Imagine that. In other words, the whole life is a waste if you're not born again. Because at the end of it, you're going to burn. But those in Christ, at the end of it, you're going to live. And you're going to live abundantly. He needed to be transformed from a state of unrighteousness to a state of righteousness. Proverbs 11.4 states, it's righteousness that delivers from death. He was standing before the only one that could deliver him from such a state. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he needed the author of life to, to breathe life into his empty soul. Are you getting the picture? He needed to know Jesus beyond a miracle-working rabbi come from God. This is what everyone needs. A correct view of who Jesus is. A wrong view of Jesus colors the way you see everything in life. Everything you do and say and think has to do with how you view Christ. Ponder that for a moment. Apart from Christ, you look through a man-centered, sin-stained lens, and you know nothing else. So you think you're doing right. Well, this is what my mama taught me. This is how my dad raised me. This is what I learned from my family. This is what I've been taught by the culture. It's the wrong lens. It's a cracked lens. It's a counterfeit lens. It's a lens that Satan put on the end of your binoculars. You want to look through that lens? This was the case of the other Pharisees like Nicodemus. They claimed they could spiritually see. Their, their lenses were clear. To which Jesus replied, but now you say we see, your guilt remains. He said, you, you have the wrong lenses. You don't see right. You say you see clearly. You're blind. You're guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of sin. They put themselves up here. And Jesus said, you're not up here. You're not even close to being up here. You're so far down. You're hell bound. There are many that profess a wrong view of Jesus. Even many professing Christians have an unbiblical view of Christ, believing that someone can receive Jesus as Savior, but reject Him as Lord. But yet it's absurd to the highest degree to say that Jesus can assume His office as a priest to save sinners and not as King to rule their hearts. You can't divide Jesus up. A.W. Pink poignantly agreed, saying, It is a delusion. To imagine that his priestly sacrifice may be received while his kingly rule is refused and that his blood will save me, though I despise his government. Christ is both Savior and Lord and in that unalterable order. You can't alter it. You can't change it. He can't be one and not the other. You are not saved because you gave your heart to Jesus but rather because Jesus gave you a new heart. Amen? Gave you a new heart. Christ came from heaven became the, and became incarnate as the babe in the manger. To be born again means also to be born from above, and this is the life of God has descended from above, from another realm, from the abode of God, and implanted into our souls. You are not a sick person that needed to be made well, but a dead person that needed to be made alive. The Christian has been brought with a, bought with a price. His or her life now belongs to Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, Emptiness is written upon everything till the heart comes to its Savior and Lord. The new birth is a change of who is enthroned on your heart. Can you get that picture? The very center of your life. Are you seated on that heart or is he? Is it your will or is it his? Your will will take you to hell. You have God's promise on that. You can get the greatest job in the world and be making six, seven, eight figures. It doesn't matter. You're still on your way to hell if he's not on the throne of your heart. When Christ is seated high and lifted up in the temple of your life, you have a purified heart, a transformed mind, and a will that bends to do his will and not your own. Whereas previously your prayer was not... Not your will, but my will be done. Now your prayer is not my will, but yours be done. Thy kingdom come, my kingdom go. You gained a new holy affection, biblical values, and godly desires. 
Believers have not reached perfection on this side of eternity, but we live in a new direction to glorify God and not ourselves. Self-help books, they're rubbish. They can't answer the question because self is the problem. You can't look to self as the solution. They deceitfully point to humanity. To travel on the broad road that leads to destruction, promising that everything is going to be great. One that is born again has forsaken that road and instead travels on the narrow road that leads to life. Make no mistake, there's only two roads in life and only two destinations. Every single person here and every single person you know or will ever know is on either one of the two roads. Either on the road leading to life or on the road leading to death. Which road are you on right now? And do you realize where that road is heading? Well, besides regeneration and relationship, point number two, regeneration is transformation, verse five through seven. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of, fl of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. During Moses' ministry, the miracle of plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, manna, and more testified to his identity as the Old Covenant mediator. Later, the miracles associated with Elijah and Elisha confirmed the institution of the prophetic office. Jesus' miracles confirmed him as Messiah and mediator of the New Covenant. Now turn back for a minute to John chapter 2, verse 6. There's a predicament. Jesus Jesus' act of transforming sinners and the saints is even more glorious than his healing of the sick and raising the dead. John 2, which we read this morning, is an account whereby Jesus and his disciples were invited to a wedding and the unthinkable happened. The wine ran out. This was a major black eye, a colossal failure that could result in bringing great public shame upon a family as well as potentially subjecting the groom to a lawsuit for this social malpractice. From a grieved relatives of the bride. In John chapter 2, verse 6 through 10, there were six stone water jars. They're used for purification. Jesus said to them, draw, draw some out, take it to the master. And when the master tastes it, what happens? It's water become wine. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk free, freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, the water that was used in the water pots was not for drinking. It was water used for purification. Six stone water jars, 20 to 30 gallons, equating to 180. They can be used if they were mingled with a purifier, which they were not. The Jews were concerned about the external washing utensils and plates and pans and pots and everything but the kitchen sink. Hence, their concern was not about cleanliness, but a purification of rites and rituals and ceremonies they had developed. Steve Lawson said it was dirty, foul, stagnant water. The plain water was transformed into divine wine, which did not go through any part of the wine-making process. No grape vines were involved, no grapes picked, crushed, or pressed. But wait, there's more. Look a little closer and think beyond the physical. What were the water pots used for? It was purposed for mosaic ceremonial cleansing, for external cleansing outside of the body. When Jesus transformed the substance in the pot from water into wine, what was the new purpose of the new substance? It was to be consumed inside the body. Hence the very purpose of the substance before Christ transformed it changed because of the miracle that he had done. And the Bible uses three words for miracles, which are powers, wonders, and signs. Nicodemus mentioned no one could do these signs unless God was with him. In John 2, 11, it says this, the first of his sign Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. You know the purpose of a sign. Well, it points to something. It represents something. Something is written on it to point to something else. One red light is a sign to stop a plethora of cars. One police officer holds up that stiff arm with the flat palm, with the white gloves. They can do the same, and they could stop, no matter if the lights are flickering on and off, they could stop traffic for, for hours. 
Here, there's a sign, a miracle with a message. It's a visual snapshot of the spiritual truth it's displaying. The raising of Lazarus was a picture, a sign of being raised out of spiritual death to walk in newness of spiritual life. His healing of the blind and the deaf were signs given to, give us, to show us that he gives us spiritual sight and ears to hear. What was the sign Jesus was displaying here at the wedding? I'm so glad you asked. There was no gospel. People lacked wine. That is the gospel. Jesus created wine from a symbol of old covenant Judaism, ceremonial purification water, which ultimately failed to cleanse people from sin. They hear the law and seek righteousness from the works of the law, which is nothing but hypocrisy. In this act, Jesus was declaring the old covenant was ineffectual. Their outward rituals couldn't bring about salvation and was about to crumble like the temple eventually would. A.W. Pink said, it ministered no comfort to the heart. It had denigrated into a cold, mechanical, routine, utterly destitute of any joy in God. Israel had lost the joy of their espousals. Jesus was announcing the arrival of the new covenant by his own hand, by the hand of the Messiah. And Jesus alone divinely transformed water into wine, into a different substance altogether. And there was no lack as this lasted for the duration of the feast. It was the best wine that the headmaster had tasted, let alone that anyone had ever tasted. And this is a picture of what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus and a picture of what he teaches to all of us, a picture of the new birth. Spirit gives birth to spirit. We were like that dirty, polluted, ritualistic water, but we were changed when we were born of water and the spirit. And this was all of God. No man touched that water, displaying that salvation is all of God and all of grace. You have no hand in it at all. No man could have performed what Jesus had done. We didn't remain the same nature. We were given a new nature. The greater miracle is Jesus turning sinners into saints. And that lasts beyond a day. But echoes in eternity. And is consummated at the wedding feast of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where all the elect saints of God from every nation, tongue, and tribe will gather to worship the Lamb. Unbeknownst to Joel Osteen. One's best life is eternal life. Every person must experience two births. A physical birth, flesh gives birth to flesh, and a spiritual birth, that which is born of spirit is spirit. The necessity of a second birth is clearly a display of the tragedy of our first birth. If we must be born again, something was desperately wrong with our first natural birth. And this was Jesus' challenge to Nicodemus. Jesus said later in John's gospel, I have come that they might have light and have it more abundantly. He gave us beauty for ashes. If we were not blind, deaf, and dead in sin, we would have come to Christ years ago and not wasted our life pursuing this world. But we were unable until he changed us. Then we obeyed his call to come to him. How many years did you waste in worldly living? You want to go back to those years? Israel said, oh, let me go back to Egypt where we had leeks and onions. But notice, they never said where we had whippings and beatings and were abused and oppressed. Now in Christ, you need not waste another second. You can live to redeem the time he's given you in serving him and his people. Galen preached an amazing message which has made an indelible impression in my own heart. I'm redeeming the time. But what has changed? What are the regeneration road signs, if you will? Well, this should be incredibly encouraging to you because the life of Christ himself flooded your soul. You went from being dead in sin a child of wrath, to being, a, to being made alive and becoming a child of God in Christ, raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and you became his workmanship, his poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared in eternity past. He brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you did not receive mercy, now you have received mercy. You became a new creation of God. Your hard heart replaced by a new heart. God sprinkled clean water on you. He cleansed you from your uncleanliness and from all your idols. You changed from the broad road leading to destruction to the narrow road leading to life. Romans eleven seventeen and 18. You, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. You, we were, you were brought in. Not just, there was not just believing Israel. Believing Gentiles were grafted in together so that Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. Romans 8, 15 to 17. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hard stop. You can take it to the bank that we are children of God. Not that we, we are becoming. We are. If you're in Christ, you are a child of God right now and no one could rip you out of the Father's bosom. And if children, it gets better than heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I know, we don't want to suffer. But what our Lord experienced, at some level, so will we. And if you love him, you'll suffer for his name's sake. Pastor Peter reminded us about Perpetua. He said a pot by any other name is, is wrong. Perpetua said, I am a Christian. I cannot be called anything else. Amen? Knowing regeneration is transformation leads us to point number three, regeneration in characters. Verse eight. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can anyone, picture this, how can anyone break Satan's shackles, the ruler of darkness, off of their arms and legs, off of their mind and heart. How can anyone break the shackles on their own? Is it possible? No, not at all. We're like Samson that had our eyes gouged out and are powerless to do anything. How can anyone just use their free will to decide for Jesus? No differently than choosing an your favorite ice cream flavor, or taking up a new hobby. We were born dead in sin, and in sin did our mother conceive us. Or as Vodi Bakum says, we were born a viper in a diaper. Romans 8, 7 through 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Here it is. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh Cannot please God. Paul's trying to say something here. Yet we have Arminian brothers and sisters who say, no, you can break out. You just cooperate with with Jesus. You just decide for Jesus and then boom. You, You don't want to decide for Jesus when you're shackled. People are shackled by Satan and counted as enemies of God. We have neither the desire nor the ability We have neither the desire nor the ability to break our sinful shackles because our whole nature is sinful apart from Christ. But thanks be to God, there is one that came down from heaven that broke the shackles. And this one is the Son of God. He did what no one else could do. Romans 6, 8 through 10, Now if we have died with him, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. He broke the shackles. For death, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Does this describe you? Has he broken the shackles of sin off of your life? I'm not saying that you never sin, but you're not a slave to it any longer. 
It's, it, it, it's not the anchor that's just dragging you down day in and day out. Are you alive in Christ? Because if you're not, you're dead in your sin. What Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about, that which is born of flesh is, fl is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, without which he would be banned from heaven. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed, transformed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The shackles are off. And one day we'll, we'll be unloosed from this, from this body, this, this unredeemed flesh. Our soul is set free, but the, the body still wants to sin. In Luke 23 and Matthew 27, hanging on the crosses beside Jesus were two thieves that mocked him. While in agony himself upon the cross, God put the brakes on one man's mouth. And God's spirit suddenly blew into the dead heart and transformed the penitent thief, causing him to immediately receive new life. He went from mocking to manifesting God's transforming power, asking Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus replied, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. John chapter 1, verse 41 and 42. Simon Peter was regenerated in Christ's presence and Jesus gave him a new name, changing his name from Simon to Cephas, meaning Peter. He went from Simon representing his old life to Peter representing his new life. The change of name displayed the change of nature. Revelation 2.17 says in heaven, we're going to be given a new name, reserved for the redeemed, displaying our identity and oneness in Christ as we bear his likeness and God's ownership over our lives. In Acts chapter 9, Saul was en route with letters in hand to bind Christians and bring them to Jerusalem to have them summarily executed. Did he suddenly stop, have a moment of clarity, re-examine his life, and say, you know what, I think I'm going to become like those I'm trying to kill. Let me start by saying I have decided to follow Jesus. No, Christ sovereignly transformed and spiritually resurrected him as a new man. And he was bursting and beaming with vibrant spiritual life. He traded carrying letters of persecution to write letters to God's people. Only the new birth can transform a murderer into a missionary. Why do you call yourself a Christian? Where did that originate? Acts 11.29, some of you know, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians, which literally means belonging to the party of Christ or a follower of Christ because their behavior, activity, and speech were like Christ. They looked at the disciples and they said they could tell that they had been with Jesus. Does this describe your life, your thoughts, your words, your deeds? Can people tell that you have been with Jesus? Not only a regenerated regenerated characters but let's hone in on one particular character verses 9 through 13 a regenerated rabbi point number four jesus answered him are you the teacher of israel and yet you do not understand these things truly truly i say to you we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen but you do not receive our testimony if i've told you of earthly things and you do not believe how can you believe if i tell you heavenly things no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So here we see that the teacher needs to learn from his own teaching. Nicodemus came to Jesus in darkness and unbelief, not in the light, not wanting to be associated with Jesus. He came on the sneak. He really misunderstood the identity of who he was speaking to. He stood before Christ, but he didn't know Christ. He didn't know the mission of Christ because he was spiritually dead. Realize this. As the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus would have taught, 
on this doctrine, on the doctrine of regeneration, on the doctrine of the new birth from Ezekiel 37, 24 to 26, which speaks of God replacing a dead heart with a new heart. He, he taught this lesson. But problem, he didn't actually learn his truth. It was more of a hollow academic lesson, a data dump to his hearers. He preached the text, but it never transformed his life. It was all in his head, never in his heart. George Whitfield said he had, an, he had orthodoxy in his head and a devil in his heart. He taught us about God's kingdom, but he lived in the kingdom of darkness. Turn forward, if you will, to John chapter 7. Starting in verse 44. which reads, some of them wanted to arrest him, Jesus, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said, why did you not bring him? The officers said, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them said, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arise from Galilee. They were wrong because Jonah was that prophet. The officers went to arrest Jesus, but something happened. Jesus' words arrested them. They were captivated, fascinated, and affected by the truth that just spewed from his lips. They didn't see a criminal to arrest but a true teacher to listen to. But look what happened to Nicodemus. In the same way, take your hands for a moment, just put them over your eyes. All right, close your eyes. Now keep your eyes closed, take your hands away, and you see a little bit of light. Now open your eyes. In the same way, rays of sunlight splashed on closed eyelids on a bright sunny day. Light had began to penetrate his darkness and unbelief on, the, on his eyelids, if you will. He's now defending Jesus before the chief priests and the Pharisees to which he was party to. Look again at verse 51 there. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And so Nicodemus, he's breaking with the establishment. He's severing the cords of identity politics and beginning to understand who Jesus truly was. The wheels are turning in his mind, yet he's not yet crossed over from death to life, but he's being drawn closer to that line. But closer to that line still means he remains dead in sin. He's not yet birthed into the kingdom. However, the Holy Spirit is preparing the heart, the soil of his heart, for the new birth with the imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 Regeneration takes place immediately, in an instant. But there are steps that lead up to that decisive moment when we are being drawn to Christ. And this may take place over a period of time. And the Lord is drawing him out of the water of sin and into the net of salvation, he, reeling him in, if you will. Spurgeon said, some are gently drawn and scarcely know when, and others are so suddenly affected that their conversion stands out with, the noonday, with noonday clearness. After Christ was crucified, in Matthew 27, it tells us a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, also who was a disciple of Jesus, went to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. Joseph was going to bury Jesus in his own tomb, which had been cut out of the rock as a fulfillment of the scripture in Isaiah 53, which prophesied that Christ would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And there was only a three-hour window to accomplish this, as Jesus died at the ninth hour, and all work must stop when the Sabbath begins at the twelfth hour. Joseph, as a rich man, would have had servants, but he tapped another man to help. Turn to John chapter 19. Sort of like a sermon Bible study. And verse 38 John 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, 
who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he, took, so he came and took away the body. Look whose name shows up. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Joseph steps out of the shadows, a heroic, courageous, bold step, and identifies with Jesus. He's a wealthy man, but Christ is worth more to him than all his riches. But there's someone next to him. There's someone beside him. Another brother who also steps out of the shadows. Nicodemus is standing next to him before Pilate when it is most costly and most dangerous to do so. And he doesn't come empty-handed. He brings burial spices with him. And just so any, no one gets confused, this was the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. Not to be confused with another Nicodemus. To display that Nicodemus had been regenerated. Just as Jesus had been crucified. There could have not been a more inopportune time. A more unpopular time to identify with Jesus. Than in Jerusalem before Pontius Pilate. Both of these men are putting their money where their mouth is. Recall in 9-11. We saw people running out of the buildings. Where were the firefighters doing? They're running into the buildings. And these men here are running into the fire. Except for John, who was at the foot of the cross. Where were the disciples? Well, they were running away. They were hiding in the shadows. Because Jesus said to them, You will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus forewarned them. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And in John 13, 16, he said, a servant is not greater than his master. In their minds, they presume if they crucified Christ, we're next on the chopping block. That's going to be our fate. We better hide. Jesus even warned Peter by prophesying of his upcoming thrice denial of Christ, which Peter summarily fulfilled. But while they hid, where was Nicodemus? He's attending to Christ's burial with Joseph having been brought to an understanding of who Jesus truly was. His actions displayed. The Holy Spirit had birthed him into the kingdom. He's not identifying as a Pharisee or one of the elites of the Sanhedrin or even as the teacher of Israel that Jesus referred to him as. Now he's identified with the crucified Lord, standing before the very man, Pilate, that sentenced Christ, his Lord, to the cross to die. He's seemingly unconcerned if he'll suffer the same fate because he's passed from death to life. No longer deceived about if he's in the kingdom or not. He knows he's in the kingdom. We don't know when. We don't know where. But we know that Nicodemus finally received the new birth and had come to Christ. Well, in conclusion... Where are you today? At what stage of Nicodemus' life are you at right now? Stage number one, Nicodemus was initially moved by the miracles of Christ and became astounded by the metaphors of Christ. And although he physically came to Christ, he had not spiritually been regenerated by Christ. Are you one living in darkness? Maybe you're hearing that you can't earn your own salvation for the first time. That you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Are you unsure about who Jesus is today? Is he something other than God in the flesh? Something other than the way, the truth, and the life? Is this where you are? Stage number two. Remember Nicodemus was defending Jesus. Have you been pondering about what you've heard about Christ? Maybe even examine the scriptures. And the person of Christ is becoming a little bit more than just a historical religious figure. Are you starting to think this Jesus may be who he says he is? The one who is the only doorway of deliverance and means of salvation. Perhaps you are being drawn closer to the line of salvation, but yet you still not crossed it. And you remain with rays of light about your eyelids. 
but it has not penetrated your eyes to remove your blindness and given you spiritual sight. Are you kind of in the middle? In the middle is still lost. Understand. You're in stage number three. Nicodemus asked for the body of Christ. He stood before Pilate. Put himself on the line. He was born again. Have you been born again? Have you crossed the line, repented of your sin, and believed upon Christ and identify with Jesus? Are you a disciple of Christ? Has Christ become the focal point of all your affections and your relationship with Him is paramount to all other relationships in light of family, friends, and co-workers? But not only relationships, but are all things as dung in comparison to Christ? Jobs, money, hobbies, houses, cars, toys, and the like. Are you one that bears their own cross and follows Christ for the sake of Christ? Do you count everything as loss, as dung, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, and count them rubbish in order that you may gain Christ and be found in him? It is those in this stage that are heaven bound and have assurance of the new birth. Everyone here right now and everyone you know is at one of these three stages. The first two are lost. Only stage three is regenerate. Either in pitch darkness, close to the light of Christ, yet not in Christ, or in the light of Christ. And there is no other option. Close is not enough. You must be in Christ to be saved. When the ship is going down close to the lifeboat, not enough. you got to get into the lifeboat to be saved. Noah wasn't told to draw near to the ark, but enter the ark of salvation to save him from God's flood of judgment. The new birth was a defining doctrine of the preaching of George Whitfield, so much so that a woman asked Whitfield after preaching a service, Mr. Whitfield, why do you keep saying to us you must be born again? Whitfield replied, because, dear woman, you must be born again. The new birth is non-negotiable and fully rooted in God's word because it's a scriptural birth. Well, let me ask you a few questions of application. If you've been totally transformed by this, your life will manifest it. Do you know of Christ or do you know Christ? Do you confess Christ or possess Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he enthroned on the heart, on the mind? Do you have assurance that you have the new birth today? Examine yourself to see when you're in the faith. Those were the words of the Apostle Paul. If he would examine his own life, how much more should we? Number two, if you say you have a relationship with Christ, do you also have a growing relationship with the body of Christ? Do you have a yearning to be with those you're sitting next to? To call them, to think about them? Or is it, okay, did Sunday, check mark, I'm out the door, off to work on Monday, see you next Sunday. Is it, that, that's not the love of God for the body of Christ. Yes, we all have busyness in our lives, but we are one another's lives because we are the body of Christ. You can't separate the body of Christ from the head who is Christ. When Paul persecuted the church, Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Is the mission of your life to preach Christ, to live for Christ and not yourself? Or are you too busy, caught up in everything else? Are you in darkness? Are you inquiring of Christ or in Christ today? Have you counted the cost to follow Christ? Is, is he your greatest treasure? Have you taken up your cross to follow him? Is everything else counted as dung compared to Christ? Do you spend time with him? And do you spend time with the people of God? Are God's people on your mind? Do you, do you cry out for the saints? Charles Spurgeon said, if you live from Monday to Saturday in the same way as if there is no God, you are a practical atheist. L listen again. If you live from Monday to Saturday in the same way as if there were, were no God, you are a practical atheist. 
Does the new birth affect the way you live between Sundays? If you've been born again, it will manifest in your daily living. If you don't know Christ today, then you're just as lost as Nicodemus was before he came to Christ. Maybe you're inquiring about Christ, yet you've not yet crossed the line. You're still in darkness. Perhaps you have the head knowledge of Christ, but it's never taken root in the heart. Hear the words of Jesus and Nicodemus. You must be born again. You await a death sentence. And behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You have personally and purposefully violated and lived in rebellion and apart from Christ and are an enemy of God. Will you come today? Will you come right now? Will you repent of your sin? And will you trust in Christ alone for your salvation? Pastor Peter and I came this morning for you to speak to you about Christ, to see you come to Christ. And we'll be waiting after the service if you want to speak to us. If God has so convicted your heart, then today is a day of salvation. Let's pray. Oh, my Lord and my God, I thank you and I praise you, Lord. For the strength that you've given to preach your word this morning, oh God. After laying in a hospital bed just weeks ago. But Lord, I thank you that more so being able to stand, Father, physically. Thank you that I could stand upon the rock of Christ and stand in Christ. And all of God's people this can do the same. Father, let us know that we know that we're born again. Not guess not just wonder, but let us know that we have the assurance of the new birth in our own hearts. Not put this off for another day. Today's the day of salvation. And if anyone doesn't know Christ, Father, touch the heart. Convict, convict. Drill down upon them, Lord God, that they may know that if they walk apart from Christ, they're walking on a road to hell and they cannot avert it and cannot break the shackles themselves that they must need Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.